You are so beautiful. Well, you know, we try to be as beautiful as we possibly can, but, you know, we also love fun in the sun. We're in California, and we love it to the max, but too much of a good thing is not necessarily a good thing. So what can you do for damaged skin? Uh, So what can be done? Well, we're going to check in with Dr. Adam Shiner, uh, author of the Wall Street Journal bestseller, The True Definition of Beauty. I want to find out what the answer to that one is. Now, Dr. Shiner is a laser eyelid and facial surgeon, so he is in the know. Dr. Shiner, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Mary Jane, thanks for having me. You betcha. Okay, first of all, what is the definition of beauty? Well, beauty is really in the eye of the beholder, but there's a mathematical part of it, too, that has to do with facial ratios. And in my book, I actually prove this out um, through examples uh, using uh, ratios and mathematics to prove um, what our subconscious brain likes to see. Okay. Uh, Because, you know, it is difficult to figure out what beauty is because everybody has a different opinion about it. You know what I mean? Right. You know, actually, I had my book out and uh, I, the New York Daily News, um, two mayors races ago, um, had me evaluate the candidates for mayor based on their facial appearance. And uh, then I had a photo uh, editor uh, edit their images to what I would recommend they change if they want to relate better to the electorate. And uh, they did that. They put that in the New York Post. I didn't realize everyone who saw the New York Post, but Howard Stern called me. Oh, how cool. <laughs> and then he, he, and so he wanted me to go on his show. So that was on Howard's show and teaching him and showing him about everyone's face in the same way. And they loved it. It was really fun. So did you tell him what he should change? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Oh, very good. What did you suggest he change? Uh, for him, it was his lid area um, because he has some heavy lower lids. And then for his face in general, uh, volume um, to the face as we lose volume in certain parts of the face. Like women often have this thing called like a resting bitchy face, uh-huh. right, as they get older. Uh-huh. And it happens to men too. So I said volume in the right areas could help turn some of his contours around to more youthful uh, appearance. So we're talking fillers and plastic surgery and all that kind of stuff, right? Correct, yeah. Wow, okay. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about this sun damage. Now, <laughs> I, I, I've i been doing talk shows for over four decades, so you know I'm up there in age. And so years and years and years and years ago, I say like a hundred years ago, um, we used to stay out in the sun and get a tan. Um, I mean, this is going to sound terrible now that I look back, but it didn't sound terrible then. We used to mix baby oil with iodine and put it all over your body. It was sort of like <laughs> a baking a chicken, you know, <laughs> in the sun. Uh, it gave you a great tan, but I'm sure it did some damage to the skin. Exactly, yeah. So what damage? I mean, why is it so bad for our skin? Now, they tell us to have vitamin D. We should go out in the sun for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes every day, uh, as much exposure as you can get. So how do I know when I've had too much? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, I think that's about right. It depends if you're in full sun. But, yeah, 10 minutes or so, unprotected, you could stimulate uh, the skin um, and the enzymes in the skin to help make vitamin D. That's fine. So, um, so when the sun comes down on the earth, um, it brings with it a couple different, uh, wavelengths. Um, the first one is the visible wavelength and that's the light that allows us to see one. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are others that are invisible and the most important amongst those are the ultraviolet or UV light wavelengths. These include UVC, UVB, and UVA. UVC is commonly absorbed by the ozone. Good. UVC is a wavelength that makes our skin red, B for burn. Yeah. It's most prevalent from about 10 to 4. And UVA is a long wavelength that is present all day long and can penetrate deep in the skin where it fractures elastic and collagen fibers, allowing this, our skin to sag and droop. A is for Asian. Um, it can even penetrate clouds and car windows. Oh. Uh, so these UV rays can bind together parts of the DNA in the top layer of our skin known as the epidermis. And there's a 
there's a layer in the epidermis, the bottom layer called the basal cell layer that makes all the copies above it. So if that layer is healthy, then all the cells above it are healthy. If that cell layer is unhealthy, then the cell uh, layers above it are unhealthy. Well, the UV rays go down to that cell and bind in the DNA uh, parts of the day and create something called thiamine dimer. And this makes the skin irregular, and this leads to basal cell and squamous cell skin cancer. Okay. Interestingly, historically, like you were just saying, in the 70s and 80s, although not everyone was using iodine and baby oil, some people were using some sunscreen. And uh, they found that they could be out and they didn't get red. And they said, how great is this? Right, Mary Jane? Like, we can go out and we don't get red. Isn't that yeah, awesome? Yeah, and I can stay out forever. Exactly. And that's because the components that they had back then blocked the UVB rays, B for burning. Mm -hmm. Then, interestingly, you look forward like 10 you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we saw skin cancer start to rise. They're thinking, why is this since they're wearing the sunblock? And this is because it wasn't blocking uh, one of the dangerous UV rays. It wasn't blocking the UVA. So oh. people people were, were blocking UVB so they, could, they weren't getting red, and they were getting even an extra dose of UVA because normally they'd be out of the sun if you were burning. Does that make sense? Got it, got it. And uh, so now what we want is we actually have uh, sunblocks now that protect against the UVA and UVB, and these are ones such as titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. Um, they're micronized now, so they go on pretty well without sort of that white shiny look. And yeah, I was going to say, is that like the, the one they put on the nose? And it's exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're mechanical blocks. They work immediately when they apply it on the skin. And now they're looking at a lot of issues, especially where you're in California and where I'm in, I'm in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and in Hawaii, they've actually outlawed these um, the other types of sunblocks because they're not safe for the reef. So these are safe for the reef, and they're the best ones to help protect sun sunscreen. Why is it that some people, uh, if they have olive skin or uh, dark, darker skin, don't get burned as much as a you know person that's from Irish descent? You know, the skin is just so super white and super uh, you know pale. Right, they have more natural melanin uh, and melanosomes, uh, melanocytes in their skin because they are historically from sort of uh, areas that are uh, where that has more sun exposure. You know, before the modern age, we genetically tend to stay where our ancestors lived. Mm -hmm. So people from Great Britain or from Eastern Europe we tend to stay there uh, in those cloudy areas and. Uh, that for their skin, it, it just, the clouds and all the that would reduce the air exposure to UV rays. Um, as we started to migrate, we took our skin that was meant for cloudy areas and moved to sunny areas. And uh, it takes about 10,000 years actually for skin to change Whoa. from light to dark and vice versa. And that's what we've seen. We actually, we actually can show that where there was migration from Africa up to about 10,000 years and then the skin lightened because. Uh, there was issues with getting enough vitamin D to uh, prevent things like rickets. And so uh, having tan, you know, very dark skin up in the north, if you didn't have it in your diet someplace, uh, that, that affected um, people's ability to survive. So in, the, in, the, uh, in Africa, in those areas where the sun is out, if you don't have dark skin, you're burning and you're dying. Now. So anyway, it takes about 10,000 years. A tan mm. is really the body's attempt to shield it from damaging UV rays. So it might look healthy. It really is a sign of skin damage. So I've been told in the past when I've had uh, surgeons on, plastic surgeons on, and cosmetic surgeons, that you can't turn sun damage around. Right. <laughs> right. So... And, you know, once it's done, it's done. Correct. That's historically accurate. However, there, is, there are ways to do this. Um, I was talking before about, you know, most of the damage from the ultraviolet rays is to the top skin's top layer, mm -hmm. um, something called the epidermis. Yeah. And it lies in that layer called the basal cell layer. Um, I have the ability to use lasers to uh, ablate or blow away layers of the skin uh, selectively. And I can go below the level of those irregular cells. And uh, it removes the basal cell layer and all the, way, all the damage above it. And I have ways to trick the body to regrow its skin again. And when it grows it back, it grows back as brand new cells that have never seen the sun before. So it has this nice duality. It improves the appearance of skin in terms of wrinkles and 
lines and such. Uh, and it improves it with tighter skin and new collagen and elastic fibers. And the health of the skin also, because it removes uh, pre-cancers. And I can actually remove some active early skin cancers like basal cell and squamous cell. And that's, I call this a reset for sun damage for that reason. So when you use a laser, though, isn't it a fact that you have to be careful how deep you go because you can cause more damage? Yeah, you can go. There's a, there's a level that, you know, I've been doing this for, for over two decades. And so, yes, I, my brain kind of knows what level and what part of the face because the, the face has different skin thicknesses in different areas. You know, the eyelid is the thinnest, then probably the forehead. It's much thicker in the cheek and the lower jaw area. So I can selectively have knowledge about where the thickness is and go just the right depth so that the body can heal itself. Um, and the nice thing is they look a lot better afterwards, too. That's what some people like. And the other, what I like also is that I get rid of cancer so they don't have to be visiting their dermatologist as much in the future. So basal cell, there's there's different kinds of cancer, too, right? Correct. Basal is the le- less invasive. Is that correct? Basal cell and squamous cell tend to be more locally destructive. Um, the squamous cell can invade a little bit more. Um, into if it gets you know if you don't treat for you know a long time it can get into bloodstream and go to other parts of the body but in general it tends to stay pretty local it's not usually metastatic um, melanoma which is a deadly one yeah. um, is metastatic melanoma interestingly is not really directly where the sun is shining we see it in strange areas like on the back under fingernails really inside the, the back of the eye it's really uh, you know you know, on the upper leg that's covered by pants. It's really strange. The theory on it is, or one of the theories, is that with sun exposure, because it, it does have a basis in sun exposure, but it's not where the sun exposure is. Going. The theory is that we get a lot of free radicals when we get a burn, and those free radicals circulate throughout the body, uh. and they tend to land where there are pigment cells in non-sun exposed areas, and then damage those areas. And that's one of the theories why we see melanoma in this non in exposed areas. We're not sun and sun boats in exposed areas. Either. We see tons, I mean tons, of serums and creams. Um, do they really work on the surface? I mean, don't you have to get below the surface? The surface, you you can't get down there. Right. Um, you know, I went to the University of Pennsylvania for medical school, mm-hmm. and he has passed away since then, but Albert Kligman was in the Department of Dermatology. He was the one who first discovered about tretinoin or retin A. And retin A yeah. uh, has the ability to fix in the upper level of the skin some of those thiamine dimers and make the skin health again. So there are some medical products that can actually improve the skin, not as dramatically as what I'm doing, but on a more subtle level, it can be helpful. Um, secondly, there's now my procedure does have some recovery associated with it, but we take away the skin, it takes about 10, 14 days for the skin to regrow. Mm-hmm. Um, but once it does, it's brand new cells that, that come back. Um, the uh, the uh, medication I was talking about, Retin-A, is one way to help. And then secondly, there is um, there is a technology put up by a company called Cyton, uh using something called broad-based light, BDL is the, is the name of it. And there was research actually done in your state, in Stanford, where they looked at people who had these light treatments uh, three of these light treatments. They had, um, they had, you know, older, wiser patients like yourself <laughs> yeah. had, had these treatments. They had, um, they had people like yourself who had, had no treatment. People like yourself who had three of those treatments, and they had some young people too, and they did little biopsies of all the skin after after those treatments. And and for the people who were young, they didn't need the treatments and stuff. And they they looked at it um, under an electron microscope, and they looked at something called the messenger. RNA. That's part of how our cells make its, its components through messenger RNA. And they found that they had a look at the older people with no treatment, the younger people um, who also had no treatment, and they almost had a flipped amount of messenger RNA where they could show the healthy part um, and the older people had, really didn't have that healthy part. But the people who had three of these light treatments, which doesn't have a lot of downtime, by the way, it's something we could have done. Uh, they actually, their skin reverted back to a younger genetic state based hmm. on those light treatments. 
Okay. They have a name for it. They call it Forever Young Broad Based Light or BBL. I'll be darn. Now, you mentioned yeah. Retin A. Uh, it, it also depends on what how powerful the retin A because it comes in different uh, what is it five percent ten percent whatever point oh five point oh five whatever uh, yeah. Yeah, that's why I have to talk to you because you're the surgeon uh, but it, it, if you have it has to be fairly strong to to get deep enough doesn't it I mean used used on it has a way actually to get that that teaching has a way to get through the cell layers so whatever you're using. Um, it does have a beneficial help. It fixes some of the damage. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess nothing can fix it totally, right? Well, my procedure does. But, ah, <laughs> but I like that it. kind of confidence. What about injections? You know, they get in below the skin. They, they, remember, collagen used to be really hot. And and they used to have all these creams with the collagen. And you're going, no, nah, that's not going to work. But injections of collagen did some good, didn't it? Yeah, for, well, in terms of like facial ideas, I was mentioning, I mentioned to Howard Stern, and, and we do injections it's done all over the country. Um, so injections in places where people have lost facial volume, um, usually around the mouth area, on the jawline, um, in women as they get older, uh, sometimes in the temple and the cheeks as well. Um, adding volume back with things, they have things, uh, collagen is used as much, but the hyaluronic acids, like uh, Juvederm, Restylane, mm-hmm. uh, Versa, these uh, products actually have been used very successfully uh, in the face to revolumize lost volume of the face. Yeah, those, those are, they're called fillers, right? Right, and they don't necessarily make the skin level healthier, but there has been some research when these fillers are done, interesting, people will build collagen. The skin can build some new collagen by the use of these fillers, so there's a short-term effect and a long-term effect by doing these sort of fillers. Didn't they used to use um, fat? Also, your own fat and, and inject that? Correct. People have done things like liposuction and taken abdominal fat and then used it in the face as a way to restore volume. I myself um, have seen some patients when they've had a lot of that done, uh, if they gain weight, their face actually grows because <laughs> because the fat in the face is different than abdominal fat. That fat in the abdominal area is meant to grow with calories in the face. No kidding. Um, yeah, so it's a little strange for me to see it in the face. And then sometimes some of it will last, but sometimes some of it doesn't last. So sometimes there's some tweaking involved in that. I find that these ones that we, and then, then you have to have surgery to do that. I think the ones we get off the shelf, the hyaluronic acids, and another one's called Radius, um, uh, and another one called Sculpture. There's a lot of them out there. It's ones that you can rebuild your own collagen. I kind of like those better because they're more predictable. Got it. Now, they even put implants um, in, like, the labial folds. I'm sorry, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and those last, I actually had had that done, oh, mm-hmm. quite a few years ago. Uh, yeah. and, and they never go away. I mean, they still they do a good job. And they can do a good job. I mean, the product probably goes away, but, um, but your own body that still collagen around it, that's what's safe. I'll be done because I mean I can put my fingers there and I can still feel it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing. Now lasers, you, which kind of laser? I've heard about cold lasers uh, as opposed to other lasers. There's a lot of different kinds of lasers. There is. Um, so I use something called a dual pulse erbium laser by a company called Cyclone. They're the ones that make that broad based light forever young. I was talking about. Oh, okay. Um, Erbium is a very uh, clean laser in that it deposits all, all its energy into the water in our cells, and not a lot of heat goes behind it. And that's kind of nice. Um, it makes it a safer way to do the procedure. Mm-hmm. Um, if there are places that we need a little heat type skin, this laser has the ability to turn that heat on or off. And that uh, functionality or tunability, if you will, I makes this really an ideal technology for doing what I'm discussing, uh, especially as I talk about different thicknesses in different parts of the face. If I can change the power in different parts of the face, it allows me to customize the solution. The other thing, too, with the laser, now, how, do you have to have a lot of sessions to do that? It's one, it's one procedure. 
one procedure. Okay, because they have some, well, this uh, it's uh, not as, as invasive, and it's about 10 or 12 treatments, and you're going, well, really? I just don't get that. <laughs> Well, the uh, the broad based light I was talking about by that company, Cyton, they're forever young. Uh-huh. The broad based light uh, would be a, a few treatments, two or three treatments, um, about a month or so apart. Um, but once it, uh, but once that's done, then some sort of maintenance, like maybe like three times a year or so for maintenance, can be used. Yeah, even with the fillers that you mentioned, uh, it depends. It also depends on the person. Because uh, sometimes they say those fillers last uh, six months to a year. Other people have it a year and a half, too. It, it depends on your own system, doesn't it? It does. I mean, certain people met- metabolize things a little bit faster than others. Gotcha. Uh, the other thing is find a pro who knows what they're doing. You know, you hear things like, you know, with Botox, and they have Botox parties. And I'm going, Really? Who's who's <laughs> injecting the Botox? Because there can be some damage done if you do it the wrong way. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, Botox and things. Um, it, it it tends not to be too dangerous as long as it's done. You know, with someone who knows what they're doing. You know, knows how to do treatments. I actually train people in in correct ways to do Botox and fillers. Um, but yeah, I I think it's a medical procedure, and I don't love the idea of doing it in a non medical setting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, cause, and oh, that's the other thing. Uh, the, what you notice probably on most people's faces is a little bit of puffiness under the eyes and yeah. and the crow's feet. So, what's good for that? Yeah, the puffiness under the eyes. Uh, there's two things that can occur there. One, there can be puffiness under the eyes, which is actually um, lower eyelid fat that can push forward as we grow older. Sometimes that can make someone look tired when, even when they feel fine inside. Mm-hmm. And um, we can do surgery actually with a laser to reduce uh, some of that fat so it doesn't push forward like that. And then sometimes people have issues with swelling on the cheeks. Oh, really? Uh, called festoon or malar mound. And the laser that I use to improve the, the skin, I actually also will use on these malar mounds and festoons. To, uh, to tighten that skin as well. Jeez, a lot of new stuff, huh? Absolutely. Lots it, of ways to help people. Yeah, well, is it still, I mean, evolving? More things coming out? Yeah, that's what's nice is that uh, the nice thing about this, that, this field is that there are new ways that we can have, uh, find ways to help our patients as, as time goes on. Yeah. So when a person comes in, what do they ask you? I mean, do they say, this is what I want? <laughs> or do they look a picture, you know, make me look like this? Uh, how do how do they, how do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, most people have an idea. They'll say that I don't like this, these lines on my face, or um, I'm looking tired. People tell me that I'm tired, um, or I look sick when I'm not sick or tired. And then we kind of analyze the face and, and try to understand where the messages are coming from. Interestingly, we don't have a lot of patients who are vain, uh, look at their face in the mirror and say, look how great I am. It's not really a bad thing. It's really <laughs> more communication. Okay. You know, if we start to look uh, older um, or, uh, or tired when we're not tired or mad when we're not mad, that, fr- that is frustrating. And a lot of what we do is really cleaning up these communication methods, uh, messages that people are putting out there. Gosh, that's amazing. How long have you been doing plastic surgery? About 20 years now, 21 years. Gosh, that's amazing. There's probably not much you haven't seen, huh? Uh, we have seen a lot over these 20 years. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, what's the most difficult when someone comes in and, and their expectations are out of reach? Um, yeah, that's part of this uh, this relationship that we build because um, it's between the physician, especially as I'm a surgeon, and and the patient, and so if we don't see eye to eye, often I'll say, well, you know, I'm sorry, I don't think that I can really achieve what you're asking for, and that has happened, um, but uh, most of the time we can come to terms about, um, you know, and if we educate them correctly and they can see photos and things like that, they say, okay, yeah, that's, that's what I have, that's what I would like, and as long as we have communication, clear communication, then we can go ahead. It's amazing, too, because, you know, you see some people who've had makeovers, especially, you know, remember, down south here, it's Hollywood. Everybody yeah. does plastic surgery there. Right. Uh, but they look like they've been in a wind tunnel. Correct. Yeah. When you, they do facelifts, 
uh, where they're, where they're, they're trying to, it's interesting, people have a facelift done because they want to pick up the jawline or tighten the lower face, and that is helpful, okay, that can help improve the jawline, but I will say if the skin is still damaged, it doesn't look quite as good, and if they're trying to, if they're trying to improve the skin by pulling on it, that doesn't really create the result that you have to look it's more of that in what look that you're looking for. Yeah. I can say if you have a piece of wool and a piece of silk and you pull on the wool, wool will it ever turn to silk? No. <laughs> no, right? No. They're different. <laughs> um, and so if you have sun damaged skin, you get a facelift and you just pull on it, does it make it more youthful? It might make the contours more youthful, but it doesn't really make the skin more youthful. Yeah. Uh, with this laser treatment I'm talking about, though, I think this is very powerful because we can really take uh, sun damaged skin and make it new again. I can take wool and pretty much turn it to silk as, an, as a metaphor uh, when we're doing this sort of procedure. So if a person needs or you know, is looking and saying, I think I need plastic surgery, I need a facelift, can you do that with a laser? Um, facelifts are primarily done with, uh, with incisions. They could be done with a laser. The people tend to do it with a blade or with a cutting pottery device. It's a different sort of uh, procedure. Um, but we're improving the skin after we're using these laser light sources. Amazing. Now, do you have a, a website? I do. Um, if, if you look up, uh, if, if they look up Reset, R-E-S-E-T, for sun damage, that's easy for your listeners. Okay. But if they want to look up my name, as, a, as an interesting spelling, but just go to adamshinermd.com. Terrific. Um, they can find things, but they can find me on Instagram and on Facebook. Social media is a lot of places that people uh, contact us these days as well. And where is the book available? book is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Fabulous. Well, this has been enlightening. Thank you so much because, I mean, we all want to look good. Uh, I, it drives me crazy when you see these, you know, 25-year-olds on TV and they're, this serum took my wrinkles away. If you have wrinkles at 25, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you're in big trouble. Maybe you were in the sun a lot when you were, when you were 13, right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> big time. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, stay on the line because I want to ask you a question off the air, okay? Sure, Mary Jane. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Yes, yeah, same here. Dr. Adam Shiner, uh, the definition of beauty.